So, um, uh, welcome everyone to um, uh, a new lecture as part of uh, the department series for uh, spring uh, 2022. Tonight we have um, Eli Abbas, uh, who's an architect and a graduate of the Lebanese American University in 1997. Eli obtained a post-professional master's degree in architecture and urbanism from the Architecture Association in London in 2000. He then joined the international firm of KPF in London. Apps co-founded Accent Design Group in 2007 in Beirut and is managing partner and principal architect at Accent DG, where he takes on the design and supervision of substantive, high-end and experimental projects. Apps designed award-winning projects that have been published and exhibited internationally. In parallel to his practice, Apps joined at the U's School of Architecture and Design as adjunct faculty between 2017 and 21, where he taught the final year project. So Eli, we're very uh, honored and happy to have you with us tonight, and we're looking forward uh, to your lecture. So floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction, Eli, and uh, for the invitation. It's uh, always great coming back to LAU, to which I owe a lot as a student and as a faculty of the architecture school. In uh, tonight's lecture, I'm going to be sharing with you a selection of some of the projects that we worked on in Lebanon and UAE, reflecting on the relationship between topos and uh, architecture. One of the interesting definitions that we find online for the word topography is that topography is a field of geoscience and planetary science and is concerned with local detail in general, including not only relief, but also natural and artificial features and even local history and culture. So those features uh, mentioned above are features of a situation. And for us, understanding the particular conditions of every situation is key in kind of formulating our architectural approach. Topography has always played a prominent role in man's creation and in his style of building. To illustrate this relationship between architecture and topography uh, through concrete examples, we went back to the first intuitive reaction man, man presented towards his topography, and that is vernacular architecture. We realized that in each condition, our ancestors were very specific in their response, and they created different responses for different site conditions. We can clearly identify through the land, the memory of the place, and the people that once occupied it. For example, if you look at how villages reacted towards steep slopes, we see that their intuition was to transform the steep slopes into terraces. And the terraces dictated in their turn the, the way the villagers lived. On the terraces, they planted and made, and made a living but also they position their houses in a way to be in complete harmony with the topography and the natural environment. Yet when faced with a different situation, with a different site, they reacted with a completely different answer. In Tripoli, for instance, if you look at the narrow flat land that used to be between the coast and the city, they transformed it into agricultural field, which acted as a buffer zone and housed different types of lemon trees. In Jumezi, for instance, they had a completely different response. They transformed the slope into stairs, a vertical neighborhood. They used the stairs as an extension of their houses, generating layers of dialogue where they meet, exhibit their product, and fest. This symbiotic kind of relationship was not just only found on a macro scale, but, only, but also on a micro scale through materiality. So whatever material I found on the site, and based on the properties of those materials, it shaped, they shaped their architecture. From limestone, they built, they produced an architecture that is different than the one formed by mud bricks and, and, and so on and so forth. In a way, the materiality dictated architecture and the lifestyle of those who inhabited it. For example, in the village, the way man lived with nature and his climate was heavily defined by the material they found on site. They lived in houses that were resistant to the climate. And, and, and not only that, the material has also a social impact. Since men couldn't find, couldn't lift, uh, couldn't lift those heavy stones, uh, the spans of the houses were defined by the latter. So due to these smaller spans, 
they were forced to live in smaller spaces with less privacy, yet stronger familiar bonds and stronger sense of community. By nature, this architecture was in tune with this climate because it was shaped by the material which was found in the actual location. Unfortunately, this kind of symbiotic relationship that was generated by the specificity was lost due to the interest in globalization. Dubai was transformed into a shiny artifice and Lebanon into a chaotic disorder. In our architecture, we try to regenerate this intuitive response and this specificity, which is the resultant of our understanding of the conditions of the particular site. To put it simply, we try to create an architectural entity that if taken from its site and put in another location would simply not make sense. The first project I'm going to be sharing with you is the uh, terraces in Riyadh, uh, Lebanon, a project that we finished in 2018. The project is uh, located in the small village of Riyadh. Uh, it's a village in the Shuf region, nestled at 840 meters above the sea level. When seen from, uh, for the first time, you can directly identify the genuine relationship between the villagers and their land. And it's illustrated simply through the traces of the terraces and stone houses. So, and, and, and so the village is located within this valley and the surrounding, the surrounding mountains. In 2012, when I first visited the, 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 the site together with the client, it was my first encounter with the site and my first visit to Bria. Looking at the site, which is a triangular site, you can, you can see traces of the stone terraces, which tells you a lot about the history of the place and the memory of the place and the way people live and occupy this topography. Just to give you a brief uh, history of the village, during the Lebanese Civil War, there was a lot of destructions. Uh, the, the Christians have, had, to flee to, had to flee the village. And, you know, when standing, when standing there, you had the feeling that the village is empty, especially that also that a lot of people uh, had to leave the village because of the economical pressure and they moved to Beirut to uh, look for jobs. Still, when you're looking at this landscape, there was something very peaceful about it. There's a sense of tranquility. And it's this kind of feeling that was something that we tried to carry out through the design process. It's something that we tr try to preserve and it's something that we try to respect. And for us, you know, it's through, with our architecture, we try to respect it and not to disturb it. The land is around 12,000 square meters, and the client wanted to build a single family villa. Uh, the client had four kids, uh, his mom lived with them as well, and his brother and sisters, uh, or his sisters also used to visit during the summer. And then the second time, and then the, you know, the kind of connection with the client took a while for the project to kick off. We then met again after 2013. By that time, the uh, reconciliation happened in Bria. It's one of the last villages where the reconciliation after the civil war happened. And then we came back to the site. The image on the left is where it was taken in 2012, and the image on the right was taken in 2000, I think, 15 where you can see a completely, you know, a completely different, a completely different scene. Uh, the one on the left gives you this, the one on the left, you read this sort of harmony, uh, the, you read the natural environment and the, the, the harmony of the way people lived in this, with, with, with the actual landscape. While the one on the left, you see a completely different sort of attitude, especially that after 2013, when people came back to their village and they started building with a very, in, in a very chaotic manner especially based on the fact that at that time, the Minister of Interior allowed for uh, people to build structures which are uh, under, I think, 150 square meters without getting any, any, any construct, without the need for any construction uh, permit, which led basically to a very chaotic, uh, to a very chaotic kind of uh, uh, situation. So there's a different connection with the land. Before there was, there was harmony, and now you see it more, you know, people were looking at the landscape in a completely different manner. I don't know if it's maybe they're looking at the, at, the, at, the lens, at the landscape as an investment or maybe it gives them a sense of security where they had to build 
uh, you know, uh, many floors without any consideration with the, for the landscape. But definitely there's some sort of a greed that you sense in the way things were done. So, and, and those people were investing in new construction and forcing heavy infrastructure and alien volumes into this kind of serene landscape. And uh, also our client here is something I think is important to mention that in between 12 and 2015, the client hired another architect and what they've done basically, they've erased all the traces of the terraces in order for them to build this roads which connect the lower level of the land to the upper level. So they, in, they kind of erased all of these traces or findings uh, that were originally on the site. So one of the typology that was present in the area, among others, like the vernacular architecture, were this kind of typical monumental forms, which also ravaged the landscape, something, something that for us from the beginning we wanted to avoid and try to attempt an intervention which is integrated within the landscape, the context, and the history of the place. You can tell by looking at this, at, at the fence, at the sort of enclosure they're trying to create, it looks more like a castle, and maybe it's also like a message showing how rich or powerful these guys are, without any consideration for the actual landscape. So, we started, you know, the project went through different phases. The first one on the left was one of the first sketches that we tried to uh, uh, sort of develop on the side, rotating around this idea of fragmenting the house into different parts and all of them wrapping around a central space. And then the, 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 the second one uh, is, is a series of three slabs, again wrapping around this idea of a courtyard, a, a U-shaped configuration organized around the house. So it's organized into three slabs. Uh, we presented the, the, this project, I think, back in uh, 2000. 14 or 15 and then the client sort of disappeared went back for a couple of years and came back and then this is when he decided that okay i want to build a house but he decided to reduce the size of the house reduces the size of the house i think now it's around 1300 in terms of built up area it was much bigger than that so if you, if you look at the the last sketch on the right it's a u-shaped configuration that encloses an outdoor outdoor space which is open to the landscape and underneath you see all the terraces. So the house was positioned on top of the hill. It sits in between two different gardens, overlooking the panoramic view in front of it and the constructed stone terraces with natural, band with natural boundaries from the three different sides. On the bottom part, we have a natural canal where the, which is parallel to the street. On the right side, we have the a natural existing terraces of the neighboring plot, and on the back side we also have another terrace above the above the house. So and and you can see here on the road that the vehicles could reach the parking, which is which is here where the car is showing. Uh, it's embedded. The parking is embedded in one of the terraces, and the vehicles could reach it through this the sloped road and the rich greenery. So, looking at this image, you can tell that the design of the house is highly inspired by the landscape of, and the territory. We can see from this picture how the terraces, which were once there, were reconstructed, following the natural topography of the site, with the house sitting, with the house sitting on top as an extension of this topography. The house was not trying, we're not trying with this house to compete or impose itself on the landscape. Rather, you can feel that there's a sense of continuity, sense of balance, and uh, for me, also like sense of respect between the intervention and the actual natural environment. So there's a symbiotic kind of relationship where architecture and topography, they become one entity. So when you look at the house, I like, when I see this image, I like to think of it as, as a house that sits in the middle of the landscape with no fence around it as if the project illustrates the whole village as its site. So the approach to this villa is through a meandering road at the bottom of the hill, passing through the terrace olive groves, which follows the natural topography. The building that falls, if you look at the building and the, and the terraces, and the terraces underneath, it accentuates this horizontal composition as a terminal point. In this section, we can read Clearly, the terraces and the way the house is positioned on top. We can read also the house as another series of terraces to be defined only by the contrast 
of its rights to go. So here you have this, this, this terrace and then another terrace on top and when the, the terrace here could be accessed from the master bedroom. So the house continues with the language of the terraces. So the resulting U-shaped configuration encloses an outdoor space and a courtyard or a courtyard with a pool. Almost like, and this outdoor space is almost like a piazza, open to the landscape and framed by, by two wings. One, the lower wing, which is the private one, and the upper one is the private one, and the lower one is the, uh, the uh, public one. So spaces are tucked between two gardens, and the circulation flows from interior to exterior, reimagining how the villagers live in unity with nature. The composition is in two volumes. It's separate yet connected through the main entrance. And on the front and side, the public functions where you have the living and uh, dining. And in the back side, we have the family areas, which were contained in a two-story structure, linked by the communal kitchen at the heart of the house. So the family section of the house contains the family living, the, the master bedroom, children and guest bedrooms, and the gym, which can be accessed through a private separate entrance located at the basement. You know, translating the traditional qualities in a contemporary approach, the villa offers maximum porosity at its ground floor level, and especially around the, the kitchen, which plays a key role as the heart of the project. Family and friends used to access the house through the main kitchen door and used to gather in the kitchen where preparation of food used to take place kind of reflect the simple life of the villagers. They used to eat together in the kitchen or take it out to the courtyard or to the dining room or the family room. So the kitchen becomes a, some, a, a very social space. Together with uh, uh, landscape consultant Exotica, we work on selecting a mixture of local plants and trees that would fit perfectly within the natural landscape with a main focus on the olive trees olive tree for the for the terraces. The foundation of the house is clad with the same stone using that we use for the drywalls, further accentu accentuating the connection of the architecture with the territory. And the local stone at the base contrasts with the Mediterranean one stucco walls on top. The central courtyard is accessed by uh, from the kitchen and the, 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 the two-story uh, family area. The courtyard uh, gives into a double height space, uh, the double height uh, space in the, in, in, the, in the family room, which hosts the, 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 family, the family area, and, and with a bridge that connects, connecting the bedrooms on the upper level. So there's a very strong sense of continuity and, or, and, and connection between inside and outside. The pool on the, in the left image uh, shows the pool which is lying on the edge of the terrace, opens up to its context, enjoying its, a panoramic view of the majestic mountains. The private family room leads to the outside which profits from a genuine connection between the project and its infinite context. Another view showing the pool and the courtyard and the connection with the context. On the east facade, which houses the entrance, the family enjoys in the afternoon the shade in the summer to drink their coffee in the warmth of the sun. We, we can see an intricate network of staircases that was introduced, trying connecting the different terraces to each other and to the house on top, generating moments of encounter. The mixture of material we've selected, terrazzo, uh, the, the natural stone, the stucco and wood, blends in perfectly with the natural environment and they're in tune with it. Through, through the network of stairs, the visitor basically discovered the guest bedrooms completely concealed in one of the terraces as a playful attitude towards what's natural and what's designed. You can find them here at the lower level of the terrace, the lowest terrace and underneath the house as well.
the volume with uh, its public functions hovers over the landscape where we had the main living and dining, framing instances and pictures of the terrain below. The connection between the house and the terraces was highlighted with this one meter cantilever. The corner of uh, the main salon opens up completely to the landscape and becomes like a balcony where people can enjoy the panoramic view. Here on the back facade, the circulation protrudes to connect the two levels of the family zone, reinterpreting the typology of the exposed stairs and the traditional Lebanese houses. Through local building techniques, the project invests in the local know-how. The ter terraces were constructed using local styles and traditions, as well locally sourced materials. For the building, we use concrete, which is a common material and accessible locally. So looking at this last image of the uh, terraces project, one cannot but notice the sense of harmony and balance between the house and the natural environment around it. It sits in a very peaceful and comfortable manner in its place, thus becoming part of the place. The second project I'm uh, going to be sharing with you is a competition that we were invited to. It's A plus W Civic Engagement Hub. We won the second prize for this competition. And we were invited by the German Foundation to design the Civic Engagement Hub, where social cultural activities would take place. The project is in Tripoli and different settings with the aim of engaging the community and reinforcing social relationship. The center is to be designed as a platform for inter-community exchange, targeted but not limited to youth and young adults. It acts as a hub that blends together recreational activities with education. The plot is uh, around 1,200 square meter flat land located in a new urban expansion to the northeast of the uh, city center on a site that was formerly an agricultural land. Looking at this area of blue, you can directly read how the city is taking over the agricultural, agricultural lands. While initially the flat coast between the sea and the city or the mountains acted as an agricultural field for different types of lemon trees, now they're seen more as a perfect real estate opportunities. So the large plot was divided into, was subdivided into smaller plots for development projects. Typically, to maximize the profits while abiding to the rules and regulation, the city would look like the illustration, would, it would look exactly like, uh, like this illustration in the near future. So the A plus W center was designed, taking into account prospects of urbanization of this specific area by proposing a structure that would naturally blend into its context. So the main question was how to design a building that reflects a contemporary institutional character, a building that is porous and inviting structure, engaging the community and reinforcing social relationship. Unlike, unlike the typology of existing institutional buildings, which are unwelcoming, static and monotonous. So first we start, started, so first we started our design by positioning the building based on the building regulations and zoning ordinance. Then we try to generate uh, a public access that infiltrates through the volume, kind of inspired by the soup typology. Then multiple layers of stairways and outdoor terraces, allowing the public to navigate all the spaces without entering to the building or the, to the, uh, to the uh, private spaces of the building. So it's weaving a thin thread between the public and the private. Finally, the, 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 the outer membrane encloses the building, inspired from the courtyard typology, accentuating the inner void that acts at the lung of the project. The project we designed was organized along three different entities. The ground floor included the public functions such as the coffee shops and exhibition spaces. Above, we had co-working spaces, meeting rooms, vocational studios and workshops. And in the basement, we have the performance and visual art spaces. So 
So the, looking the, the building is composed of four floors in addition to a basement and organized in a U-shaped configuration around an inner courtyard that acts as the main public forum, connecting with the upper floors through open spaces that bring light directly and indirectly into the inner courts. The circulation, which you're seeing here in pink, in pink acts as a public loop that connects all the project without access to private functions. Through its, uh, uh, the design of its porous facade of perforated metal sheets, the building had an inviting and inclusive character, encouraging young people and others to experience its various spaces. It gives an open air, it gives in to an open air courtyard with a public space on the ground floor and a continuous public link from basement all the way up to the roof. This is a view of the ground floor showing the main public functions, such as the exhibition space and coffee shop. It shows how porous the design is, and by opening these spaces together, the whole floor could become one big public space. The network of uh, staircases and terraces are imagined as spaces of encounter, where informal meeting and chats could take place, a vertical promenade inside the building, an artificial topography that connects the people and the different levels of the building. The basement, the basement was reserved for the performance and visual art, with a space for 200 meters. You reach into you reach into this foyer, and that, this floor included the music studios, amphitheater, library, movie theater, and recording studios well access to the main ground floor. Looking at the, the theater space, it was designed as a flexible and adaptive space that could accommodate for different scenarios. The building's uh, main floor was organized to include the main public functions, such as the coffee shop and exhibition spaces. On the first floor, we had the uh, co-working space, a library, and a conference room. On the second floor, uh, it was dedicated to the vocational training spaces, art studios, and art garden. Workshops, the workshops were located on the third floor, which can be subdivided into different uh, size studios. As part of an environmentally conscious approach, Recycled material was used, such as wood, plastic, reused furniture, etc. So the souk typology is translated vertically through the artificial topography, highlighting this three-dimensionality of the space and the sense of discovery through labyrinth paths. The building invites the public to its internal public areas and channels them through generous stairways around the building and across the different floors through an engaging space that is adaptive, flexible, responsive, open and inclusive. Uh, the project is site and climate responsive. It adopts multiple tools to ensure a sustainable response to the program. Native trees, water and power strategies in addition to urban farming on the roof, introduce a responsible approach towards both local and international uh, uh, climatic problems. The design of the A plus W center does not aim to appear as static, forbidding structure, but rather invites the young people to experience and use its various spaces, in a way creating a synergetic synthesis between architecture and everyday life. This, this final review shows most, I think, the, the kind of balanced relationship we try to create between architecture, topography, and, and the natural environment. Uh, the third project I'm going to be sharing with you is uh, Sarada Training Academy, a project that I think we started in 2018 and finished in uh, 2019. The uh, new Sarada Training Center is in Ashrafiye and this was meant to house the uh, training academy, 
it's this part of the building. It was meant to uh, uh, to be like the training academy for for Saradar. The space had the building had an 11 meter street facade with minimal openings, resulting in a very dark interior with very low ceilings. And what we're looking here is only two thirds of one third of the building. Two thirds of the building or two thirds of this space was underneath the building, the tall building in the back, which resulted more into this basement kind of experience. Very dull, uh, lack of natural light, and a lack of natural ventilation. And what you can see here on top is the 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 terrace, the terrace of the building or this canopy, which was used as a technical area for the building. On on the right, you can see the experience of the ground floor when you first come in into this uh, uh, facility, which was used to be as a bank. You come in see, and you have this low ceiling. So the challenge, the challenge for us was to reconfigure this existing space in a way that effectively expresses the creative and agile strategy of, of the bank while accommodating various functions required in a training academy. We needed to transform the interior into a vibrant, open and enjoyable space. We started working together with our engineers, trying to resolve the different challenges inside the space, be it structural or lack of natural light or, 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 or lack of natural ventilation. The picture here shows the first intervention we did in the space, demolishing the slab in between the two floors so that we can open up the building, create this kind of comfortable space and bring in more natural light to the, to, to the space. Also, you know, we can directly identify another challenge, which is in the second part of the building, the need to bring in more light into the back of the project, which took most of the space, despite having a very low ceiling and approximately no light. And you can see here all the leftovers of the structure coming from above, the above building, the building above. So the proposal, our proposal developed as an adaptive reuse of the existing structure, transforming it into a hub of activities that we perceived as a journey along, along a track field with a number of activities taking place along the way. The track, which is a continuous loop within the space, is used both for uh, circulation and spatial definition. The journey begins in the, in the main lobby and this is, from, this is the part from the street side, which is a, a double height space, double height communal space, flooded with natural light. On the, the upper, in, the upper in, the, in this diagram, upper part of the diagram, we see these two luminous curvilinear room that we've created. And then we see the running track here and the leftover space in the building, which we use as a communal space. So the design intention was to break free from the conventional rigid corporate model of conference room around a lobby and to provide a more flexible kind of environment allowing various working conditions and the possibility of chance chance encounters to take place so we saw it as as a creativity hub fluid flexible and a mixture of formal enclosed uh, 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 enclosed and informal open spaces all services were located on the periphery in the basement and in, in the periphery like here or in the basement, in the basement level, taking advantage of rather a dim location. On the upper level, which is open uh, to below, an outdoor terrace was created, while part of the space is covered by a large net. Here we have a net in between, uh, in the middle of the void that we created, providing an area for resting as well as allowing light to penetrate to the lower level. The old existing structure with, within the city was morphed into a vibrant social space within the neighborhood. You can see how the terrace here was transformed into a beautiful uh, outdoor garden in the middle of the city. So the looking at the uh, communal spaces, they host different playful work uh, uh, typologies. They host a, 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 coffee, a coffee station, informal uh, gathering zone, two type of booth, uh, working tables and stairs that lead uh, to the upper level and the outdoor terrace. Further along the track, 
further along the track meanders between two luminous, two luminous spaces enclosed by curvilinear glass hosting the virtual and the training rooms. The virtual room on the left, on the left side, with its mix of uh, ergonomic seats, provides a more uh, secluded area for the training workshops. So by consulting with a professional lighting company, we were able to completely transform the dark and deep basement zone into a luminous interior. And the glass curvilinear facade allowed light to travel through the space and to break the rigidity of the already existing structure. On the other side of the track lies the second space hosting two training rooms at its center with the flexibility of opening up to uh, one another. Uh, the, the, to project the qualities of the outside to the inside, uh, unusual materials were used to highlight different zones. Wall finish varies between uh, concrete, paint, plywood paneling, and, 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 mirror, and mirror treatment. The track is epoxy, the shade of the bank's purple on gray concrete floor, with zones of wood and grass highlighting each of the two enclosed spaces. The bank's uh, ethical statement are displayed graphically on walls along the journey. So mirrors and a backlit polycarbonate beam all add to the textures of the, uh, of the, of the space, transforming the leftover structure coming from above into a main lighting element. Here we're seeing the kitchen with an informal seating area. So the playfulness of the space is interpreted through different typologies. One of them is a double level living wall what we call the living wall, which incorporates seating niches along one edge of the building. The unusual, the unusual use of uh, the wall and the different settings offer playful moments to unwind or to brainstorm. So the design injects life into the project through the various experiences. Some, some of these experiences are planned and others are informal. Taking the stairs, we reach the second level where another, another layer of booth overlook the, the, the hammock or the net. The promenade on the track uh, finishes at the, roof, at the roof garden on the second level where hammocks, daybeds and couches within a spurt of green allows for a breakout moment in the middle of the city. Uh, finally, ending uh, our reflection with a line in the sand, a project that uh, we're currently designing and working on in Kalba in the UAE. Kalba, just to give you an idea, Kalba is known uh, to have a fisherman population who lived at the coastal linear strip since 1970. And after the discovery of oil, it developed a road network leading to its expansion. So the inhabited area in 1970, which constitutes of almost three square kilometers, will expand to reach around 23 square kilometers by 2025, which highlights the governmental interest and its development as a new ecotouristic uh, attraction. Also in Kalba is known for to enjoy strong cultural value, uh, since it still holds some of the few traditional UAE houses. From those houses, we can directly read the relationship between the locals and their specific site and climate, where mud brick, thermal mass walls, wind towers and narrow alleyways were used vis-a-vis -vis the harsh weather conditions. What is interesting about Kelba is that it preserved those examples of this specific architecture while being just two hours away from the context of Dubai. Dubai is a city in which, you know, a city which imports different models from uh, around the world, 
without customizing it to the local context, climate, and culture. Directly, a question pops up in our mind, how should we build in the UAE? Currently, we are uh, trying to answer this question through uh, five different projects, spanning the themes of uh, leisure, FMB, campsite, and residential villas. In each and every project, we interpret the site condition through a specific architectural response. Today, we will present Villa Calva as one of those uh, responses. So first, just to locate the, our project in the UAE, Kalba forms a two hours drive from Dubai by taking the highway from Sharjah and a five minutes drive from the Arabian Sea and the border of Oman. Oman. One directly feels the different of, difference of scale when they leave a, a forest of skyscrapers in Dubai to be welcomed into the mighty and endless void of the desert of Kalba. With a strategic uh, site, our client, which is a government-owned uh, company, saw in Villa Calva an extension of the economic and touristic path they're envisioning. So they asked us to design on the site uh, a rental villa where tourists could enjoy the serenity of the desert, uh, of the desert dunes, and all the activities that happens within them. So the project is to take place in a complete silence where gaff trees, camels, and nomads form its neighbors. Different from the uh, typical image that we had in mind when thinking of desert, Kelba is a rocky, rocky rather than sandy desert, and is surrounded all around by mountains and dunes. Our site in, uh, uh, in particular enjoys an interesting configuration. From the road, we access the site through a gated fence, since it's, it's, a, it's, it's a reserve area. And through a diet approach, we climb the hill to reach a private plateau with an, existing, with an existing abandoned structure. However, it had no architectural value. And together with the client, we've requested its removal and its replacement with a new intervention, with a new intervention. So what was mostly interesting when reading the site is the strong definition that the, uh, uh, that the elevated plateau had, sitting majestically in its surrounding. It overlooks the, the, the mountains and the Gulf tree, Gulf tree Reserve. Also in the background, here you can see the, the Kalba flag, uh, Kalba flag square, which reminds the visitors of their location vis-a-vis uh, -vis the near city hub. So for us, the building, building and, and, and this site comes with great responsibility as all of the desert becomes part of the site. The site, the site has an area of approximately 15,000 square meters, uh, which form uh, of the reserve and the plateau. The plateau is the only area we're supposed to build. It had an area of uh, 1,200 square meters. The site is uh, fenced all around and directly accessed from, from the road. By, 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 cutting, by cutting through the land, we understood directly how the four meter difference between the road and the, uh, and the plateau, how, the, how it could play in our favor. This difference in level could play into our favor to provide a layer of privacy. So while, while standing, uh, uh, while still enjoying you know, this visual connection with the reserve and the desert views, when standing on the hill, the visitor directly feels the vastness and emptiness the desert had to offer. So, but the design of Villa Calba situation was heavily influenced by uh, limitation factors. For the, the brief that we received from the client was blurry and fluctuating, but mainly revolving around the idea of a three bedroom rental villa of around 400 square meters with a pool but um, we had minimal virtual communication with the clients. Sometimes we were limited to a 30 second call. Uh, also the site being inaccessible since it's far from Dubai, having long distance uh, with the office in Beirut also played a, a, an additional element of, uh, uh, of pressure on us or another form of limitation. And of course the need for fast production due to time constraints which is something that very typical here in, in, in the UAE. 
our, in, in our first proposal, it was uh, heavily embedded in the culture of the UAE and of the intuitive response the locals presented to their social and climatic situation. And that is the courtyard typology. First, we started by shaping the void on top of the plateau. And then the volume wrapping around it in a rather, uh, in, in rather an introvert approach. And the third step was to open the courtyard towards the view, transforming it into a U-shaped configuration. And finally, the U-shape was then subdivided into public, private, and service and uh, service blocks, giving out to communal outdoor uh, activities. The proposal had, uh, you know, strong spatial qualities and was heavily embedded in its social context. The courtyard formed uh, the datum around which could access the main living zone, which overlooks the main view, and the bedrooms on the second end, each acting as a sculptural monolith in, in the hill. However, the client's rejection formed a reality check. We understood how the social fabric is changing by the hour in the UAE and how our intervention should appeal to any person. So we, we went back to our land and we tried to read hints, clues and traces that are already there, but only needed to be unveiled. Therefore, we identified two signs and we decided to develop them into two, two new uh, different options. By doing that, we developed two new proposals. The first one that was presented, we called it the Oasis. And the two new proposals, we call them, one of them called the Edge, and the third one, which is the Line. And in both proposals, we were trying to find something very specific about this topography and try to connect to it. At the end, we opted for uh, uh, option, option three, which is uh, the Line, in which we've decided to further develop but this idea of always exploring uh, uh, different options and different possibilities allows us always to kind of develop a better understanding of the relationship between the site and, and, and the program. In a sense, in option three, which is the line, we tried through this approach to mimic how any and all design used to take form in the desert by drawing symbols and lines in the sand. In this, uh, in, this, in this proposal, we read the strong qualities of the slope. This line which emerges from the land upwards, like a sacred journey from the public busy road to the secluded top of the hill, connecting with the silence, vastness, and emptiness of the desert. So this simple proposal echoes the silence of the desert by projecting the existing land into two slabs, the floor and the roof, and leaving the act of inhabiting to happen in between. As such, the, 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 line, form, well, the line was formed by emerging from the road up to the hill. The roof is then folded to, uh, uh, to project the land underneath. Uh, forming an observatory on its accessible roof. The volume is then carved to house the main entrance and the car access. And then finally, a pause and punctures translate to windows, skylights, and courtyards, bringing the view of the desert and the sky to the reach of the inhabitants. Uh, through the plan, through the plan, we can read how we access the project directly from the road. Through the main stairs, the visitor reaches a sheltered outdoor space to be welcomed inside by an open uh, living area, housing the, the, the kitchen, dining, and living room. The main door acts as a main separator between the services to the left and the servant spaces to the right. From the living room, one catches the glimpses of the mountains behind and is embraced by the view of the Gaff Reserve to the north. At the end of the project, three bedrooms suite enjoy maximum natural light through thick recessed windows. 
throughout the spatial discovery, we have these uh, skylights which bring in a sensitive natural light to the inside while framing scenes of the clear blue desert sky. In a sense, the line, the line becomes one continuous promenade from being completely outside and under the sun to a shaded uh, outdoor area to being in complete solitude and unity with the silent desert. When, when we reach this kind of simple, sensitive, uh, silent and specific architecture, we knew that we reached the balance between our intervention and the existing, existing site. Uh, it gives so little information from the road, looking at the project gives so little information uh, uh, from the road, leaving the curious visitors to wonder if the line ever meets the horizon. The visitors could even continue their promenade from the road up until the roof to stand there trying to grasp the 360 degrees views which surround them. In a sense, the memory of the place of the actual site is preserved. By, by accessing uh, uh, through, the car, through the car, the visitor is embraced by the wilderness on both sides up until reaching the canopy, which signals the arrival to the, to the entrance. Despite its simple approach, the villa presents multiple layers of complexities, where each and every puncture plays a role and creates a different encounter with the frame of the surrounding. The main, the main frame opens up to the uh, sunken pit, the pool, and the bar area, where multiple events and gathering could take place around the warmth of the fire, hugged by the majestic mountains and the, and, the, and the stars. What happens on, on a macro scale happens also on a micro scale. The material used in, in the project, such as the natural stone, the aggregate, and the corten, form a natural continuation of the existing, existing rocky land. And it transforms the interior into a sophisticated space with natural and innate qualities. The project kind of uh, disappears into the view and the sky to form a natural extension of what was before and what is yet to become. When standing on, on the hill behind, the building merges into, into, into the land. And finally, I think in, in, in one gesture, the line responded to all climatic, site, economic, and social conditions which form the situs. Interlocked with its topography, this line could simply make no sense if inserted in another location. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie, for this uh, lovely lecture um, and the lovely selection of, uh, you know, uh, I would say very, very uh, uh, expressive buildings in relation to your uh, philosophy and understanding of, uh, of uh, an architectural intervention within chosen sites. Uh, I'm just going to open the floor for questions and comments. Uh, I don't know if Dr. Haddad wants to start first, if he has his camera open. I opened the camera for uh, participation only. To oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Uh, I'm sure also the audience might have uh, some question. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are, you know, uh, there's additional information to be acquired about many of the projects. Uh. Uh, if I may. Yes, yes, Dr. Kipianos, go ahead. Eli, uh, truly thank you for this lovely presentation and the diversity of projects you went through. And while following your presentation about the projects you went through in Lebanon, I was curious to see what you're doing in UAE. And this is when really I was too happy to see 
uh, what you did reach in your innovative proposal. Although I was a bit concerned when I saw your first interpretation in slide 90, because it reminded me what you did in, in, in Lebanon. And I was too happy that you shifted completely to this new proposal. But I'm a bit, um, just one uh, idea or um, question. Because you're adhering fully to that site, uh, why you didn't consider an integration on the lowest platform laying on the ground in a crescendo manner? Because you mentioned the idea of data. As such, you did set on the upper level, on top of the hill and the data. But in this proposal, while going up, uh, did, you, did you investigate the possibility of adhering even at different steps in the inner proposal, or it was a bit uh, hard to do that? Um, I'm not sure if I understood the question uh, properly, but I think what we try to what we try to do with this with, with this intervention is basically uh, to kind of mimic the existing topography or the existing uh, memory of the, as this actual site and how you experience this site. First, we had the the, the street. And then we had the hill, which takes us up to this plateau, which was a man-made kind of plateau where they had this piece of intervention. So while going through these uh, 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 different possibilities that we've explored, again, at the end, we ended up with this, uh, you know, we reached this level or this, uh, this final intervention where we tried to do the most simple kind of intervention that took into consideration that kind of captured basically uh, you know, uh, capture the qualities of this of the actual topography, and try by by connecting the project as if it's kind of emerging from the actual topography. So on one, end, it starts you know it starts uh, with, with with this direct connection with the hill to allow for the car to drive to drive by, and then gradually it starts to emerge to allow for the architecture to happen in between the uh, the ground and the and the, and the roof and the roof slab. And uh, I'm not sure if I was able to. Yes, uh, yes, yes, uh, yes. Correct, because really, it's amazing. Uh, bravo, Eli. It's 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 excellent. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Lee Harfouch, can I ask? Yes, of course. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Bakash. <laughs> thanks, 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 Eli. Thanks for uh, really for the beautiful work. I from the uh, housing, uh, the mountain to Saradar projects and with this last project. So, and the topics that you uh, really you know, talk about, the relation between the site uh, conditions and how this uh, site conditions could generate ideas for uh, for projects. So I, I was uh, asking uh, Hike Eli, and what is the link? Uh, bet because if I look, for example, at the uh, uh, technique level of, uh, 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 the presentation of your uh, work, you know, had to, you know, between the different, uh, the different projects, you know, I, I, I saw in somehow, for example, a different level of technique, how to present the projects, how to approach uh, the projects, and uh, all this issue. Well, I, I was asking if uh, you have uh, really, you know, a common. Uh, uh, a common uh, tools uh, to uh, present your projects uh, or a common tools to present uh, your ideas your philosophy in uh, in, in 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 the projects so uh, for me this it was like uh, missing because like uh, every projects have uh, a different tool of uh, representations or different technique uh, to represent the work for example yeah uh, th thanks for all. i think Yes, maybe, yes, I think you're right in a sense. Um, you know, preparing for this specific lecture took me, took a, a lot of effort and energy from us, you know, because we're very, very sort of busy with, uh, in the, with the professional practice, with the kind of work that we're doing in the office. And things are happening at a very high pace, especially after my move to Dubai, where I opened up a new branch for the company. So mm -hmm. really, we're not having enough time to, you know, to kind of sit and reflect 
on 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 the stuff that we're doing. For us, the, and, and and this lecture for me, it was a great opportunity to self kind of self reflect on the work that we've been doing. But yes, I agree with you. And this kind of uh, you know expression or the presentation that you're talking about is something that you know takes a lot of time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> To develop to develop a you know uh, a, a language or a, a language a person language for how you you know you can present your project where you can capture exactly the qualities of this project and how you like to present them so yes i agree maybe there's something i think um, um it's something you know i think which is due on the you know the kind of pressure the professional practice is is putting on us we're really not finding enough time to you know uh to sit, you know, um, you know, to sit carefully and to develop to think about these matters. No, because they are really very, a very interesting project. And thank you, thanks, thank you. Thank you. In Haddad, no questions from the students. Where it let me is. Let me here. Maybe Eli, you should uh, advertise for a position uh, open to allow your students to actually focus on representation. Now that you mentioned it, that you need more time, <laughs> maybe they'll be interested in, <laughs> in applying for for such no, a position. No. Um, but I don't know, Eli. I I, I might. Uh, you know, contribute just for the sake of the discussion. Um, um, you know, it's interesting that uh, you're highlighting, uh, and I, re I respect the fact that you're quite honest about the context of work in, um, you know, in in Dubai in relation to even, you know, how how you're facing a different um, interaction with clients. You know, time given for feedback or clarity of brief, and how. You know, through throughout all of this, you have to negotiate uh, what you think is adequate uh, or of value uh, in relation to your firm. Probably before uh, uh, what is considered as value to the client, but uh, within this, um, I, I'm I'm kind of trying to see uh, how how would this um, how would you negotiate with with bigger scales. Because I think what you've shown today uh, is somewhat uh, of, of a relatively, you know, comparable scale. Probably the biggest project was was the Tripoli Tripoli's hub, uh, yeah. and I'm wondering, you know, uh, when when projects of uh, again of a bigger scale of, uh, of a probably more complex program programs, if if it's something that you're already dealing with, because you said you're dealing with multiple projects in, in Dubai, how, how would this scale up? How would you be able to keep this kind of level of, of sensitivity? Um, yeah, I think in, in Dubai, the, the five the five projects that we're working on are relative like small scale projects, mm. very sensitive ones, very sensitive sites. But uh, to answer your question, we're currently working on a project with in Thailand, basically. Which is we're working with the developer on uh, developing a, you know, uh, a residential residential uh, compound which is composed of around uh, fifty apartments that varies from sixty to one twenty square meters. Mm -hmm. And definitely the main idea, the main idea of the client is you know is profit driven. They want to maximize on the profit. But there's something I think that which is very common in our projects is the way. Uh, the way we approach the the site, of course, that should always be. We always try to create some sort of a balance between the client's requirements or the client's ambition in the project versus what is it that we want to do architecturally with the or with, 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 with our uh, with the project. So there's always this sort of balance. And this project in Thailand, the other day I was also thinking about it while preparing this lecture, and it was one of the ideas whether we want to share it yes or no. Because it's a much larger, uh, much larger project as well. It's around, I think, six thousand square meters of built-up area on a piece of land which is eleven thousand square meters. And the, the the land again, the land, uh, the land was uh, was right on the beach in in Thailand, in a very like sort of virgin area with you know which direct, direct connection with the beach and so on. 
and there's the street and then there's the land which was completely flat and then you have the sand and, and, and the water. So for us, you know, constantly when we were discussing with the client, we spoke about the experience with the empty plot, how when you park your car from the moment you park your car and then you walk, you walk the actual site, uh, being part of the natural environment because uh, in, in, uh, or the natural landscape, since this area is underbuilt, very low density, and and so you walk, you have this very flat connection. So you walk as a pedestrian, uh, uh, you park your car, and then you walk inside this land until you reach uh, the sand and then the water, and you're walking within uh, a, a green kind of field, and it's something that. Again, even with the scale of the uh, with the scale of the project, is something that we try to preserve and to carry on and introduce into our architecture. And the way we've done that is first by a kind of uh, first of all breaking the scale of the project and try to distribute it, uh, scat having it scattered in the side, uh, uh, so that we can sort of mimic the village configuration, allowing for this pedestrian continuity, this pedestrian passage from the street all the way through the village into the landscape. So it's something, again, architecturally is something, trying to understand the actual site, the actual topography, and try to capture specific moments and try to build upon. And then again, it's definitely, definitely this something has to be sort of balanced with uh, the client's requirements and in terms of areas and budget and so on. So there's always this very thin line where we, we try to uh, sort of operate. Thank you, thanks. Any questions from the audience? Uh, please, it's, uh, it's the time uh, for it. Uh, if not, I don't know if uh, Dr. Haddad, you have any concluding remarks? Uh, basically, I will echo what uh, the others have said. This is a very interesting uh, and diverse presentation of different uh, projects which share something in common, which is definitely this kind of attention to uh, site conditions. Now, the only uh, reservation I would have is uh, uh, this notion of typology. Sometimes we use it, and it's not always really, um, you know, followed upon in a way. Uh, I'm not talking about this last project, but maybe Tripoli and others where even Brih uh, Villa, uh, of which I'm very familiar, uh, the idea of typology has, uh, you know, is kind of superseded by the demands of the client or the program. So, um, unfortunately, I would say typology is no longer uh, really um, very well understood or articulated uh, in architectural uh, uh, practice and in architectural schools. So, sometimes we just have to be careful uh, uh, when we use that term. Uh, it implies, of course, some kind of uh, uh, historical continuity that uh, sometimes we we are forced to break with. Uh, but uh, but I think there is a certain uh, continuity in the approach uh, that Eli and his team uh, follow in uh, their diverse works uh, from Lebanon to to Dubai and uh, without without being repetitive necessarily. So. This villa doesn't look at all like Brih, but has some of the same kind of uh, characteristics. Um, and um, uh, of course, I'm I'm very much impressed by the sort of uh, evolution of uh, the language uh, of uh, your work from the very beginnings to uh, where you have reached now. Thank you. Thank you. Great. That's. Uh... That's the perfect way uh, to end the lecture, uh, Eli. Uh, right. Thank you again for your time and for uh, you know the effort that was put in preparing the lecture and for being with us. And uh, hopefully, we'll see you in the in the yeah. following lectures. Uh,